If you look at the map, you will see that this is literally the only way to get to the front. This road, well, there are tiny roads up here, and there are some roads down from here, but the trouble is the Russians control the Black Sea. So you can't really use that. You have to use this place. You have to go this way. And you're going through territory that's very mountainous, that is ideal for guerrilla action, and indeed is used that way. If you are going to cut communications, if you are going to cut supply lines, then you will cut them here. Where do the Armenians act? 15,000, the Ottomans estimate, 15,000 Armenian Chete, guerrillas, attack in this area. Now, this might be an exaggeration. Maybe it's only seven or 8,000. No matter, it's a tremendous problem for the Ottomans. It's a tremendous difficulty because these people are attacking villagers, they're blockading roads, and of course they're cutting telegraph lines wherever they can. Yeah. They are so powerful that they take and hold against the Ottoman troops the city of Shibin Karagasa. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to stress to you, this is something, if you talk about just a few guerrillas and things, this is an army attacking another army and seizing the cities that the army holds. And the Armenians do that in the city of Karagasa. There are, oh, stop, stop a second. Consider what it means to have a revolution, a rebellion by one group in a place. One of the essential things, if you want to have a people's war, as remember the Armenians asked for it, a people's war, I forget, folks creed. They said that they wanted to have a rebellion, a rising up of the Armenians. Well, what do you have to have? You have to have a lot of people. Right? If you are 5%, 10% of the population, can you have a people's rebellion? Of course not. It can't possibly work. You can only have that kind of rebellion in a place where there are many of your people. So, when the Armenians rebel and see, boss, is this a people's rebellion? Impossible. Why? Because the Armenians are only approximately 10% of the population of Sivas. Obviously, they can never hope to take over this area when 89% or 88% of the people are Muslims, Turks. What can they do? All they can do is act against the Ottoman army's interests. They can't hope to take over the area, especially because between the Armenian revolts, and the front is the entire Ottoman Third Army, including its headquarters at Erzincan. <coughs> the only way the Armenians could hope to win a war in Sivas or Shibin Karagasar would be if they could hold the land until the Russians came in, right? Exactly what is going to happen in Vaughan. They could do that, but that's impossible here. So why would they revolt? They would revolt because cutting supply lines and cutting telegraph lines will help the Russians win the war. That's why they rule, and that's the only way that their rule makes any sense. It's important to note that when these rebellions, like here, like the other ones we're going to mention, when they're put down, it's not simply a matter of the fight, but it's also how many men it takes. The Ottomans, at one time or another, used three divisions of soldiers between 3,000 and 10,000 men at different times are needed to fight these people. They're also needed to fight the Russians on the front. But they're not doing that. They're back behind fighting the Armenians, fighting the Armenian rebels. And of course, this is one of the reasons that the Ottomans lose so many battles. Next, Cilicia, the Chukurova region, and around the area around Adana. This is not an area where the Armenians are successful. This is an area in which the Armenians fail. And they fail because the British are, the British are not very wise when they fight the war. When the British intend to invade the Ottoman Empire, they look at three places. They look at Salonique, they look at the area around Salonika, and think they could go into Greece and then attack. They look at Cilicia, and they look at Gallipoli. And then they take the worst place. 
They attack in Gallipoli when what they should be doing is attacking here. They should attack here because it is an ideal place for an amphibious, for an attack from the sea. Gallipoli, as you know, Gallipoli is hills. It's a, it's a narrow beach, and then there are all the hills in between. And it's there where Mustafa Kemal organized his troops and managed to hold off the British. It's narrow, and so you could put mines in the Dardanelles, which they did. Here, you cannot mine it very easily. It's a great big expense with lots of places to land troops and guns, and it's flat. You can't put your artillery in the mountains. It's a very good place to attack, and it's very good also because the railroad here delivers all the supplies to the Ottomans fighting in Iraq and down in Syria and in Palestine. If you cut the Ottoman railroad here, you've essentially defeated the Ottomans in both Iraq and in Palestine. And it's easy to do because the railroad isn't completed. In two places, up near Pozanta and over here near Osmania, in two brief places, the tunnels have not been dug through the Taurus Mountains. And so you have to take everything off the train, carry it, and then bring it on the train again in another place. This means that it's a very difficult place for the Ottomans to work. The British should have attacked there. And the Armenians tried to convince them to attack there. Armenian groups, especially in Britain, especially the Hunchaks we mentioned before, <coughs> went to the British and said they had 15,000 Armenian soldiers who were ready to attack the Turks if the British would give them more guns. They did not have guns. If the British would give them more guns, they would attack the Turks from behind as the British attacked from the front, thus guaranteeing that the Turks would lose. And it would have been a disaster because the Turks had very few troops here. All the troops were in other places. It would have been a very wise move by the British. It would have been helped tremendously by the Armenians, and the British said, no. <laughs> now we'd rather attack in Gallipoli. That's showing they weren't very smart. But also showing that the Armenian rebel groups, once again, wanted to attack the Ottoman Empire and did all they can. They actually, there were, they actually did two revolts in this area. They tried to revolt even when the British weren't coming. They started in Musada and in Zaytun. Both places, but when, of course, when the British didn't come, then those rebellions were both defeated. Next, the area I've studied the most, the area of Iran. The most important area, in many ways, in the whole of the Armenian-Turkish issue. And the whole Armenian-Turkish question really is based in Iran province because Vaughan Province is where it all began. In 1914, actually even before that time, way back to 1910, the Russians had invaded Iran. Not in a war, they just came in and said, we're here to stay, and they did. They came down, by 1914, 1915, the Russians had seized all of the territories that you see in red, and had actually gone down to the first line of mountains and taken the main road in the northern part, in the northeastern part of Turkey as well. So all the area in red here was taken over by the Russians. The Russians intended to use this territory to do what the military people called turning the flank, which meant they wanted to make sure that the Ottomans had to put soldiers over here, and they wanted to be able to come around and attack in this direction. They thought it would be easier to do. It turned out it was true. They even built a railroad all the way from here down to here. So the Russians began to attack in that area, and the Turks, of course, had to defend in that area. The Turks had to try to make sure that they would keep the Russians from getting through. This was very difficult. It was very difficult. If you were going, if you were going to do something to stop 